me bring to the show first guest this morning, Mark Oswald, Chief Economist and Global Strategist, ADM Investor Services. Mark, good morning and thank you so much for joining us. Hello. Mark, I'd like to uh, take a step back and kick off with markets. Of course, we do notice extreme volatility today and in the past week. So do you think that this is going to be the scenario uh, for the upcoming quarter? And what do you think markets need to hear uh, in order to kind of calm down in terms of volatility? Uh, I think what they need to hear um, is probably central banks backpedaling. Uh, but I don't think it's going to be happening. Um, you would have to see um, a much uh, much stronger signals that the inflation pressures that are there are starting to abate. I don't think you're going to see those until we get into um, <clears throat> the second quarter. I think, uh, or, or alternatively, you would have to see a very sharp fall in oil prices. That would certainly um, help matters quite a great deal because it would then imply that on top of the base effects that are there for the in the energy sector, i.e., we're not going to get the sort of increases that we saw last year, but even if oil prices keep going up, um, but if it, if we were to see a sharp downturn, um, but again, again, that's something I think which is much more a Q2 scenario when we actually start to realise that actually OPEC can pump out a lot more when they've got their raised base quotas. But that's an issue for later. I think for the time being, markets are basically being faced with the fact that uh, um, you know, not only is the Fed basically going forward with um, raising rates and um, starting to reduce the size of its balance sheet, but that's happening in the UK, but the ECB has been backed into a corner, um, even though the battle there I think is, is going to be quite a hard one, it's still nevertheless a, quite a concession that we have. And then we've got other central banks in the, in the world also being back down, having to back down, like the Reserve Bank of Australia. The Bank of Canada has been a little bit more cautious, but it's nevertheless on the path to a rate hike, um, and also probably to reducing the size of its balance sheet. Now, none of this is coordinated, but it will be happening simultaneously. And that liquidity shock, given the underlying condition, trading conditions in a lot of markets, there's never been a lot of liquidity there, not market liquidity. There is very little depth. Um, and that's exactly the sort of thing which fosters all this volatility on top of all the uncertainty about the economic outlook, on top of all the geopolitical tensions that we have. Um, and who knows, we might have another variant of, of, of COVID coming along to upset the apple cart. And we've still got this very different strategies around the world we're actually dealing with outbreaks. You know, China and a lot of Asia is still on a zero COVID policy, um, whereas Europe and the US, basically, and uh, to a lesser extent, Canada, are you know very much in, in you know saying we're just going to have to learn to live with it. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Then on the other side, of course, we do hear more hawkish on in terms of central banks. I just wanted to show you very quickly what's going on in terms of bond market, which is extremely um, sensitive on that kind of news and that kind of stories. Here is the 10 year uh, Treasury note at 1.95. Of course, this is the yield. Very interesting situation when it comes to the German Bund, uh, plus 0.24 in terms of yield and the 10 year Italian at 1.84, along with the spread between the 10 year Italian and the 10 year German Bund at 160 basis points so far up about 1.15 percent so i was wondering mark what is the bond market suggesting and do you think that it's already pricing in uh two rate hikes from the ecb until the end of the year or this is just too optimistic call um i think it's erring on the side of caution what we're getting introduced here is a risk premium and this week on top of everything else we also have supply um we've got 10-year supply in germany uh, we have uh, tomorrow and 10-year supply in the U.S. and 30-year on Thursday. So that you know, basically the, the spread, the the pricing concessions for new, for issuance from governments is going up simply because there is that greater volatility and all of that uncertainty out there. Now, what we've effectively got priced in is really always quite difficult to enumerate. Um, I think you know the markets are basically erring on the side of yes. We might as well price in two rate hikes from the ECB. Um, you know, you've got four rate, four, four more rate hikes priced in from the Bank of England. I, I, I think we'll have a lot of chopping and changing as we go through the year. Um, I think the thing which people really need to keep the closest eye on is credit spreads. 
because there has been some widening of credit spreads above all in investment grade. Um, if you look at it in percentage terms, if, if not, you know, given that the yield, the actual basis point move is in the greater scheme of things, it's just getting back to a more normal level, which would still be historically described as very tight. But at some stage, you're probably going to have a, a one or two, one or the other company trying to refinance and finding it's actually rather more difficult, particularly when we're hearing quite a lot of um, anecdotal evidence that both funds and private wealthy investors are definitely stockpiling cash. They're getting cautious, which is the right sort of attitude in this environment because we, we don't have a clear sight of what's going to be happening with all these central banks. And we really don't know what the impact of all, all these major central banks starting to, to wheel back their um, you know, wheel back their liquidity provisions, even if the Bank of Japan is definitely at the back of the queue on that. Uh, yeah, this is uh, yeah, this is for sure. On the other side, I just wanted to touch on geopolitical tensions and specifically where y you perceive it. Uh, what is going on between, uh, of course, Russia, Ukraine, Russia, U.S. Yesterday, we saw a very awkward Biden Schultz meeting or not meeting, but press conference. That's for sure. Uh, so I was wondering if you started to consider it as one of the major risks for markets. I just wanted to remind everyone that President Joe Biden and German Chancellor Olaf Scholz. Uh, had an awkward exchange with a reporter uh, on Monday at the White House over a White House, sorry, over the future of the Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline. So Biden was uh, extremely, um, how can I say, sure uh, that if Russia invades Ukraine, there won't be um, the Nord Stream 2 project, which is on the other side, an extremely uh, important project for Germany and the Eurozone in Europe as a whole, of course, and an extremely expensive project that has been going on for many years. So I was wondering, uh, what's your take on what happened yesterday? Well, yesterday basically just re-emphasized this point that actually Germany is in a very awkward position. It's, you know, th these aren't just tensions with the US. Um, these are also tensions with with France, with much of the rest of the Europe about um, the Nord Stream 2 um, a pipeline. Uh, it's always been controversial and even more controversial because of the, the fact that uh, former German Chancellor Gerhard Schröder is on the board um, of the Nord Stream 2 project. So, um, and, uh, you know, obviously was a member of the SPD. Um, so, you know, Germany's position, unfortunately, at the moment, is you know, long gone are the days of Ostpolitik uh, that uh, uh, you know, during the, the Cold War era and the all marked above all by Helmut Schmidt. Um, you know, Germany doesn't seem, the German political fraternity just seems incapable of um, what I would call strategic thinking. Um, it doesn't understand, for instance, that basically as the former, uh, former head of MI6 put it here in the UK, that what Putin is playing is poker and not chess. Uh, but you still have to act strategically, and Germany is not acting strategically, and this creates a lot of tensions, um, I, I think, across the board. It, it, it's, it's the tensions within NATO, uh, w which are ironically just as much of a problem as the tensions with Russia. Um, in the longer run, I, 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 you know, I, I think the problem here is that uh, you know, NATO is pushing, uh, trying to bear bait Russia to a certain extent, and Russia is basically trying to provoke Na NATO. The the real risk is that someone makes um, an error of judgment, um, and I don't think it's that likely. But one can't discount the possibility that it does happen. I think it's you know it, it's less than ten percent chance, but that's still too high. But for my liking, basically. And a final take, which is on energy prices on the other side, do you, do you expect any repercussions on European gas prices? Um, well, energy prices, are, you know, we're, we're going to have a, a volatile time. I mean, Europe has sort of, I think, pretty much, given that the winter hasn't been nearly as severe as last year, it's got through it, um, but it still has a lot of these vulnerabilities about power generation. So it, it, we're still going to see all these fluctuations in gas prices um, due to the uh, due to changes in, in the amount of wind power generation, and then you add on top of that, well, what's actually going to happen with you know uh, flows of Russian gas to, to Europe? 
um, and that's very much up in the air. I think part of the problem here is also that Europe hasn't basically, it hasn't gauged how much it would need for this recovery. Everyone's trying to deal with this problem that we've had such a strong recovery after the, the cave-in during 2020 and we're not really got the capacity to deal with it and we don't really want to add a lot of spare capacity at the moment because we know that once we've got over this um, we rebuild inventories in across the whole of the world and we get chip supplies back to normal, auto supplies back to normal you don't want to have too much excess capacity because otherwise there's a big risk of uh, what I would call a good old-fashioned inventory recession so you know it's it's not it's you know that I think the biggest risks are probably behind us, but it's still going to be very volatile because of the two factors of an unstable a backdrop in terms of power supplies, particularly with the French nuclear reactors going offline um, for maintenance, um, and obviously the political factors. In uh, Mark, final take, I'd like to take step, a step back and, and talk about um, the U.S. economy, specifically after the non-farm payrolls this Friday, which were uh, well above expectations. So, so do you think that um, the Fed hawkish tone is even more, how can I say, is going to be even more harder uh, in the upcoming meeting? Well, I don't. Think, you know, I, I think they. You know, uh, as we saw actually a little bit with the, that five-four vote from the Bank of England, because that basically signaled that the majority on the Bank of England. And I think this will be also the case in, in 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 the U.S. No one really wants to get aggressive. No one wants to follow a Russia or a Brazil um, or some of the other central banks in Latin America with these really, and uh, even the Czech Republic with these really aggressive rate hikes, because they know that it's going to be quite tricky and the risk of a tantrum, a market tantrum or a cave-in, given the very elevated levels of asset prices, given the horrible concentration risk that we've got. You know, we saw it last week with Meta Platforms, you know, that, that price collapse basically tells us a, a lot about the structure of markets at the moment, about concentration risk. And central banks will be very, very wary of not over, um, you know, not getting too aggressive uh, they would rather go, I think, as uh, you know, with a rate hiker meeting of 25 basis points than saying, right, let's try and get ahead of the game and do 50. Because the moment they start doing things like 50, then the markets really will start to more than likely start to turn tail and price in many more 50 pace points rate hikes. And that's exactly the sort of thing that these central banks want to try and avoid. Thank you very much, Mark Also, Chief Economist and Global Strategies, ADM Investor Services. Have a great day ahead, Mark.